I wanted to uh, play devil's advocate uh, a little bit and to uh, make some uh, uh, comments on the concept of terroir and uh, how, uh, from a winemaker's perspective, um, there are a whole bunch of influences uh, that we certainly need to consider before we um, delve too deep into what the soil and the climate um, is giving us. And so, how many of you are winemakers in the audience? All right, wow. Handful. All right, fair enough. Um, so, uh, it has come to a point in regard to the technical uh, complexity of our projects uh, that we really can't be just viticulturists, genealogists anymore. Uh, we need to bring in people from uh, other disciplines and in my lucky case I've been able to hook up with some of the best uh, computer uh, programmers and uh, visualization specialists um, uh, in the country uh, as well as uh, some top soil scientists. So all together bringing in uh, my genealogy uh, expertise uh, we've been able to develop a uh, system uh, that uh, allows real grape growers um, in the field during the rush of harvest or before uh, to make decisions um, and, uh, and help them uh, make better wine or at least to make uh, the uh, wines that they uh, intend to do to present uh, their growing region. So we're going to talk about a few things. I'll talk about um, some of the issues and ethics uh, that relate to uh, terroir, but uh, again the system that uh, Dr. Ebert will talk about um, uh, right in a few minutes is again a simplified system uh, that takes into consideration that every uh, buddy and their uh, brother can fly a drone over their vineyards uh, these days but nobody knows what to do with the big data and how to actually utilize them in a meaningful fashion. Um, this is a quote from uh, the, the second joint Burgundy California Oregon uh, Symposium uh, that I organized uh, a few years back and uh, having some conversations uh, with you guys here again the Torah concept is still very closely connected to not just soil and climate but uh, to our culture, our heritage uh, and the pride that we take in uh, wine growing uh, and wine making. Um, nonetheless um, there are a lot of different things that winemakers can do these days, that grape growers can do these days uh, that are sometimes questionable and that are diluting uh, the effects that your Torah, that your uh, particular vineyard um, uh, is giving you. And we're going to just touch on those because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of different things. You see an incomplete list of different things that winemakers uh, do or have access to uh, and all of them will influence what you're getting out of your uh, vineyards. Um, the composition of the fruit, the composition of the wine, and of course that's also difficult to measure. You know, we're looking at uh, pH and sugars and all those uh, very basic uh, analytical um, parameters, but we still don't have a comprehensive system to actually uh, define wine quality or, or wine composition and truly compare things. The other things, uh, other thing that we're dealing with is, uh, you might have seen those quotes from Nettle McLean, uh, uh, <laughs> Canadian wine writer um, who uh, relates a little bit to the fact that we have about 80% uh, you know, middle-aged white guys in this audience here and uh, that's a problem because uh, the concept of terroir to some degree is a little bit of a macho concept that everybody knows you know, where their wine is coming from, what the soils are giving you and, and that's uh, uh, caused a problem. I teach a very large class, probably the largest wine class in the country. Um, two kids that are 21, 22 years old uh, and they are often not very interested in where those grapes are coming from, where the wines are coming from. I show them classic wines from around the world uh, but they could care less uh, about what the soil composition um, of your Pinot Noir. So you have to be really careful uh, that you, yes, pre preserve your heritage and your cultures when you make wines and grow grapes uh, but you also have to acknowledge a new generation of uh, wine consumers uh, that do not uh, give necessarily much about those old concepts. So you have to either educate them um, or come up with a new concept. The other problem is that indeed most of the grape varieties that we have are very closely genetically related, which makes sense because they all come from the same area. So you see the slide here, which probably captures 90% uh, of all red wine made in the world from each variety, from each terroir. Uh, and so that's another problem. We don't have a really truly good language to get into the details of describing all the slight, uh, slight differences. Uh, and to 
you know the uh, work here, Andy Reynolds was involved in the genetic mapping um, of uh, what is out there. Um, that's, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, an aspect that we often um, underappreciate how closely uh, connected all the varieties are and how similar they often are and how difficult it is for us to do in blind tastings even a distinction between varieties. Um, we're not even talking about white wine here, um, as you know. Um, they're even closer to some other uh, uh, products, but again, it shows that we are lacking a more uh, comprehensive, detailed language uh, that we all agree upon uh, to describe different wines from different regions. Um, vineyard microbiome, does that matter? Does it matter if you add SO2 to your crusher? All the, fancy, the fascinating research that uh, Dave Mills at Davis is doing right now. Um, does it matter? Maybe it does, but uh, how do you distinguish it? Uh, the cellar microbiome, um, there's certainly a reason why those moldy cellars in, uh, in Burgundy are giving you particular characters uh, as your wine ages in barrels, as the air gets into the barrels and comes in contact with your wine. Um, we have a lot of issues with the surface yeast, with Brettanomyces, all those wines historically. If you think 100 years back, probably most wines had some bread in it. Um, nowadays, we're keeping them either very clean or we're having native floors um, um, that incorporate, again, uh, the micro uh, biological flora that comes in from a vineyard, which is closely related to how many fungicides you spray, how much fertilizer you put on, and all those other things that influence um, um, what's going on eventually in your wine. We've been concerned about uh, residual nutrients in wine. Uh, a lot of varieties have actually more nitrogen than they need to finish a fermentation. And those are the components that uh, feed spoilage organisms and cause off odors, uh, but they also um, create comp uh, components that are uh, uh, explaining the complexity of aged Pinot Noirs, for example, that go beyond just the red and black berry fruits and a few flowery notes that we normally use to describe those wines. So there's a lot of stuff going on based on what the grapes are picking up based on what's left over um, in, your, um, in your wine. Um, talking to viticulturists, um, talking to winemakers, again, that's all important. That connection needs to be there, but, uh, but uh, again, we all can do different things in our vineyards and our wineries without uh, truly understanding. On the other hand, there are wineries that are going far beyond traditional practices. You see a bourbon barrel aged in Findel. So a lot of uh, crazy stuff is going on there too that people for a short time maybe appreciate, but all those things, again, are diluting uh, the efforts that the wine grower puts into showing the terroir that the grapes are grown in. Um, closures had a lot of cork research, and that's certainly coming back, too. There's a lot more cork taint out there, uh, and particularly subthreshold cork taint in uh, cork-finished bottles. So those volatile components um, are masking, again, the delicate uh, differences between uh, different uh, pinots from different vineyards, for example, and you have to be really careful that you take that into consideration. Um, the other thing I'm involved in is, is uh, tracking shipments around the world. And so as your wines are getting exported or even shipped around the country, they are changing. And historic winemaking practices have been addressing those. Uh, and uh, either through over extraction, oxidation, fortification, um, you have it. Plenty of uh, uh, good examples there. But it's important to realize that um, uh, things are happening to your wine as it leaves your winery. And the wines will not be the same. And again, it diminishes the distinction uh, of terrain. Um, with that, uh, we're getting close to talk about what we're actually doing in the vineyards. Um, here you see some of the examples, and we give you in the end some examples of how we describe um, our wines made from different vineyard sites and commercial test sites. Uh, you see the descriptions here for different soil types and, uh, and Willamette Valley um, uh, Pinot Noir. Um, but uh, uh, what's important too is to see what the industry wants. Our research projects are supported by the federal government, and in our case, but also by local growers. So understanding what the big boys want, you see a slide here from our colleague uh, Nick Kuzlian, who is now the lead viticulturist at Gallo, um, understanding what the companies want, how uh, they make their wine, looking at water holding capacity as a big factor, which is quite different uh, from the plant availability of water, um, and understanding the differences to what the different salts can give us and to do to the, to the, to the vines is quite crucial. Um, before I um, take David Ebert here, on, onto the podium. Um, we've been going back to Porta Lombard, so an old paper from Oregon. Um, I'll take it. Um, uh, all the different factors that are influencing um, uh, grape growing uh, and wine quality. Uh, and so with that, um, we're going to give you a few examples of what we're doing. Um, um, 4D, high resolution, deep soil, uh, real-time mapping. 
Okay, so what we were seeing here is we've been working with four sites so far in the Napa Valley, and the soils vary quite a bit in Napa. For those of you who are not familiar, there's over 300 different soil series in the Napa Valley. And you can see the structure, it's very similar to what we learned about yesterday for Oregon soils. In terms of having the volcanic, the river deposits a lot of alluvial fan action that also comes into play in this. So what we've focused on is um, in this work that we're describing today is what we've done at two specific sites. One is Trace Aborys Vineyard and Winery, which has a main vineyard, about a 5% slope. It is, according to um, the soil series, it's a combination of Coombs Gravelly Loam and Bale Clay Loam. And then the Bialy Vineyard, which is a much flatter area, 0 to a 2% slope, and it's 90% Coombs Gravelly Loam. So if we look at Trace Abores, what we've focused there on is trying to help the grower capture the difference of what's going on in her um, Cabernet vineyard and her Zinfandel vineyard and actually get more uniformity out of her crop. It's biodynamic and organic. It's in the Rutherford AVA. At Bialy, we've focused on their um, Zinfandel vineyards, two of them specifically, one that's a historic vineyard planted in 1938 the other one that's planted in the mid-1990s and show you the difference between the head pruned um, old vineyard and the newer, more modern vineyard that they have there. And to try to give them high resolution understanding of what's going on in the vineyard, we go beyond the soil survey work that gives you a classification of the soils. But we instead try to go into something that gives you a functional map of the soils. And the whole idea here is based on the fact that topography is the main driver of soil deposition. And so we take the five soil forming state factors and solve it for the topography. And this has been applied in the Midwest. It's been applied currently by the um, funding from the Buffett Foundation to map all the soils in Central America to improve agriculture there. And uh, um, fruitfulness of what they're doing and we've now been applying it in Napa. So going from the upper left, if you look when I said 90% was one soil series according to the USDA core soil maps, when we take that and we apply Phillips ALIM algorithm to this and simulate deposition and erosion over time, we get the image in the upper left hand, I'm sorry, the upper right hand corner showing you eight different soil classes. When we refine that by doing some in-core samples in the vineyard, we get this highly varying um, eight soil classes down in the lower left. And from that, by placing soil moisture sensors, we're using um, TDR sensors throughout the root zone in the vineyard, we can get the available moisture in the vineyard at a much higher resolution. And this corresponds from the experience we've had to what the growers are seeing in the response of their vines. And so we use this and in doing the soil-based interpolation as opposed to just spatial Kriegian or kernel density estimation, you get a much different picture of what's actually going on and turn it into a management tool. And with getting real-time data in, you can update that and see what's going on throughout the season. You can scroll through time, compare it from year to year. You can look at the different depths that you have across your different locations and decide what you're interested in seeing, where you're getting good evapotranspiration, where your irrigation's draining straight down through your soils. You can then use this by knowing that variation and that's driving most of the characteristics in the grapes to actually give you the variation that you're seeing in the vineyard. This is taking cluster sample data at Verasion for the Trace Aborys vineyard on the left. And the grower used that with their highly varying, especially in the Cabernet portion of the vineyard, highly varying acid that they wanted to even out. And they're dry farms, so by changing canopy management, they were able to get a much more uniform distribution of their acids at um, harvest time. Similarly, you can see where you're on target and where you're not with your sugar content. You can also do this for mapping pest from field observations in there. And so what we've done is we've taken that system and actually collected data, did full berry analysis at the sensor site locations, at Verasion, at Harvest. We've also now gone through and done fermentation separately of lots at Traceabores and half-ton fermenters and at Bialy and 3,000 gallon 
tanks and did both chemical analysis of the wines when they were dry as well as sensory evaluation. And so the two examples I'm going to show very quickly here are the two lots from Bialy Vineyards. And here you can see that the sensory characteristics, while the wines in the end, because of the winemaker's um, treatment of them, the chemi chemistry comes out very uniform because they're always suggesting that as they're going through the process. But the savory characteristics in them were quite substantially different from blind testing, from blind tasting, where you got different um, berry flavors, you got different colors in these individual lots, which really related to the drier and wetter portions of the vineyard and the availability of water and the stress that the vines were under through the growing season. So we've really tried to go from just saying, here's the variation that's in the vineyard, here's what's happening to help the grower, but how does that also carry on into the final wine? And is it something that is just treated out um, and produces a uniform characteristic in the end? And so far, we haven't found that. We have found similar results with the Cabernet and Zinfandel from Trace Abores. So that's what we're trying to do is say, can we help someone manage the process throughout the growing season and get more uniformity and also characterize those and define those characteristics of variation in the sensory profile that they may want to highlight and take advantage of throughout their vineyard. So, thank you.